Welcome back. You're listening to the Innovation and in Government Show, sponsored by Kerasoft on federalnewsradio.com and 1500 AM. I'm your host, Jason Miller. My guest today is Keith Salisbury, the Senior Director of U.S. Federal Sales for Pivotal. Now, Keith, before break, we're talking a little bit about this movement toward this modern software approach, how agencies are doing, why they're doing it. What are you seeing from agencies? We talked a little bit about the training piece, mm -hmm. but are agencies really moving in that direction yet? Or that mm -hmm. I know every agency is different, so it's hard to put a blanket. But but there has been this opportunity and this this push from the White House over the last four, five, six years. Is that starting to take effect? Mm -hmm. Sure, great question. Uh, our perspective would be what U.S. Digital Services and what ATF have has done. Uh, we think is fantastic. It's a, they've provided an outstanding framework. They've provided tremendous vision and guidance uh, to chart the course that the government can take towards modern software development. And they've gone that extra step of dropping in folks, whether it's the Presidential Innovation Fellows or otherwise, into key agencies to kind of be catalysts for change around modern software development. Uh, in various agencies. The challenge is, as we talked about before, what we've observed is there's so much calcified process and resistance that needs to be overcome in a government agency. Um, what we have seen be most effective in getting an agency to really move is when they've been able to carve off a thin slice of a business problem or a mission problem and have the right leadership and direction over it and actually produce an outcome, actually produce uh, a deliverable. Um, and when that kind of subset of the business has been able to deliver a new capability with modern software on a, in a period of time that was never before imaginable in that agency, it starts to create a gravitational pull where everybody says, wait, how did that happen? That should have taken two years to build that. How'd they get it in 10 weeks? Um, show me that again. Um, and then that gravitational pull kind of pulls the agency and wakes the leadership up um, and starts to build an enduring capability that grows in the agency and produce more and more valuable mission outcomes. It sounds so simple, right? Little mm -hmm. wins, start small, show people it can work, and then it will g gain some momentum. Yet, as you said, there's so many calcified, I'll use your word, obstacles in government mm -hmm. that you have to almost chip it away at it. Is that why now the technology behind it, the cloud, agile, DevOps, all mm -hmm. that is starting to really gain some momentum as well? Sure. So I think that... Cloud infrastructure uh, holds the potential and absolutely is delivering a lot of flexibility and alternatives for federal agencies. Um, there's still acquisition friction uh, that's a big problem, but cloud infrastructure, whether it's uh, commercially provided off-premise or cloud infrastructure provided on-premise in, in the agency's data centers, uh, is readily available. I think reducing the friction so the business and the developers can get access it uh, in an on-demand, self-service, fully automated way is is very, very important. But cloud infrastructure is there to give lots of lots of flexibility. Um, the challenge with modern software development is as an agency builds software that advances their mission, they need to be able to one build that software in a in a frictionless way so that their application development talent is focused on the business logic or the mission logic of the so of the software that they're building rather than spending all their time kind of cobbling together the infrastructure they need in order to build software. Um, and developers need a friction-free way to push their code once they build it from development environments to testing environments to the production environments where it's actually going to get in the hands of an end user. Um, that needs to be friction-free, and today that's a high-friction process in government. Um, and then the government needs to be able to do this and change their mind. They need to be able to build something great on one particular cloud uh, infrastructure and then be able to move it in a friction-free way to a, a different cloud um, when their mission demands change, when the cloud economics change, when the security requirements change. Um, those are things they need to be thinking about as part of their cloud strategy. It's interesting you bring up the frictionless way, and, and we're going to get into security in a minute. Uh, is is acquisition the biggest part, the, the biggest issue that causes friction today? Or, uh, uh, again, am I going to jump to security yeah. now? <laughs> no, acqu um, acquisition is a huge challenge. I'm trying to think of the last... Uh, and part part of this is because the way agencies are appropriated, and that's a whole different discussion, I know. But this idea that, okay, you have your pot of money, now use it. And tell us what you're going to use it for and develop your business case 
And what they really want is to say, we're going to put a little bit of money here and see how that goes. And we'll put a little more money there and see how it goes and put a little more money versus the old way, which was here's a hundred million dollars, pivotal, go do your thing mm -hmm. and come back to us in five years with, with whatever you developed and we'll not like it probably. Sure. For good reason, the government has rules and policies around if we're going to obligate taxpayer money and give it to somebody or something, uh, we need to be very clear on what the requirement is, what the expectation is, and then hold you to task for delivering against that. And when you start doing that at the scale of our government, it becomes a very big bureaucratic nightmare that's a requirements-driven process that lines up really well with the waterfall way of building software, which doesn't cut it any longer. If you flip over to the, the Silicon Valley startup uh, side of the equation, that's not how it works. It's a... Agile at its core is, hey, we've got, an, we've got a business problem. We think we've got a really clear idea of the best way to solve that problem. Let's build the thinnest possible slice of functionality to solve the most important aspect of that problem first. And let's turn that into working software. Let's get it in the hands of an actual end user. Let's get them to provide feedback. Yep, that's what we wanted or no, that missed the mark. And have that inform our next stage of development. And then let's iterate like that again and again and again, multiple times a day, multiple times a week. And every step informs the next step. That doesn't line up well with all the requirements you need to generate before you can obligate taxpayer money. So the acquisition process and the programmatic process does absolutely stand in the way. But again, I've, I've seen uh, leadership in our government um, absolutely work within the confines of the FAR to put in place contract vehicles and mechanisms to allow this to happen. But uh, a way to make progress in this would be to make that much more widespread and broadly understood and broadly available for the rest of the government. I was going to say earlier, I can't remember the last customer meeting where it got to the point where they really wanted to do this, but oh my gosh, how are we going to get through acquisition? It's like, wait a minute, that's that's your world. You're supposed to be telling us how to do that. We, we have no idea. So it is a challenge. There's been some discussion lately, especially because of DOD's success, around this idea of other transaction authority. Now, we won't go down the path of, of for this conversation, but I think that there is some recognition that the acquisition mm -hmm. is a big challenge, and how can they make it go quickly? And I think o OTAs, as they call it, is, is maybe one sure. path. I don't it, know if you're if that's what you're seeing. No, absolutely. And I think the paradigm shift, though, is... There's so much fear and, and oversight on these big projects that drive the requirements process, which is counter to what we're doing, because we've always built software for months and months and months and years and years and years before we've released it to see if it works in a program. And what you do is you're just doing nothing but building up risk before you launch the project. So when I build software for two years and then launch it, good Lord, think of the risk I've built up. What if I was launching software every week or every day? You, ne you never build up or accumulate that much risk. So at any given time, if the government is not seeing the results that they wanted, stop the, the program or the project at that time. That's the, the more forward thinking way. That's the paradigm shift for how to provide governance in a modern software uh, world versus the legacy way that the government has provided governance around these types of programs. All right, I want to move us on to that next yeah. big roadblock, which is security. One of, one of the big things that we're seeing across government is how do you build the security piece, automate it, and build it into the Agile, the DevOps. So that, that must be not just a big challenge, but also a big piece of this puzzle. Sure. So um, the security threat is real and critically important, so it's something we can never take our eye off the ball on. Uh, that said... Let's just push the I believe button for a second and assume we can all build phenomenal software and we can build it really, really fast. If it then takes me one to two years to accredit that software before I can put it into production, I haven't accomplished anything. So the way that we accredit software before it goes into production or we give it authority to operate um, today takes a long time. We have to pay lots of people a fair amount of money to do lots of documentation on that software that may or may not actually create a more secure software. Um, that's a pretty inefficient process that, again, absolutely stands in the way of moving at startup speed. Um, I think there's modern technology that, that holds extraordinary potential to change that paradigm. Cloud infrastructure is ubiquitous, and there's Platform technology, platform technology designed to accelerate how you build, deploy, and run modern applications 
that can, in a structured way, make all of the IT infrastructure immutable from a security perspective in terms of your application code. So if my platform strategy uh, makes everything from the application code all the way down through the operating systems immutable, of the 2,000 or so security controls I've got to meet in order to use my software or give my software authority to operate, uh, that platform can eliminate north of 80% of those controls. So now I have a much smaller problem space to solve in terms of accrediting the software. The next phase that we, 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 we are excited to see evolve over time is when you're building software today, there's modern technologies around continuous integration and continuous deployment of software. So if those continuous integration capabilities are pulling the software together, uh, they absolutely can automatically generate the documentation necessary for all the security controls for the application code itself. So now if I'm automating the code, the controls of the software uh, application itself, and I've eliminated the need to certify all the things in the infrastructure, that's how you can impress accreditation timelines in a, in a meaningful way. When you talk about affect the code in, in terms of the security accreditation, when I've talked to, for instance, USCIS at Homeland Security or Patent and Trademark Office, it's it's automatic and it's happening in real time, meaning they put a code to production, it's it's certified, accredited right away. And, and that's the modern software piece that the agencies are missing because if it's taken them even a week or two or three or a month to accredit mm -hmm. software, that's a month longer than getting the capabilities out to the user. Sure. So, so you guys are talking about doing the accreditation automatically. As soon as it's ready, as soon as you hit a certain mark, it goes through that automatic process. Sure. We're, we're talking about two things. One, using a platform strategy, a platform capability um, that reduces the accreditation, uh, the controls that you have to go through every time. And that's because, let me interrupt, I'm sorry, that's because the platform itself has already gone through that ATO Absolutely. process. So all you're looking at is the delta between what's the difference between what's right on the platform and the software. And the code itself. And then the, using some of the software development uh, tooling to automate the generation of those security controls for the application code itself. That holds great potential for kind of change in the way the government accredits software uh, in, in order to ensure security, which is super, super important. Do you get a sense that agencies are more comfortable with this approach to accrediting software as they go along? Or again, pockets, yeah. USCIS, PTO are two very important pockets, but is, is the government as a whole not not quite moving that direction from what you're seeing from clients? Sure. You know, it's it's kind of the classic leadership thing. I have seen where the traditional way of let me build something and when I'm done, flip it over to the fence to the information assurance folks and have them accredit it. That typically does not go so well. But in these modern approaches where, hey, let me pull somebody from the security team into my development effort from day one and have the security folks integrated into that team from the start through finish, that's where we've seen government agencies uh, make a lot of progress, kind of rethinking of new ways to ensure the software they use is not only secure, but is able to be developed and used in a, in a timeline that's much more acceptable. That's such a key point you make, bringing someone in at the beginning. We talk, yeah. Again, we talk about this all the time. It seems so easy but probably does not happen as often as yeah. it should. Uh, Keith, uh, we're almost out of time. This has been a fascinating conversation. Before I let you go, uh, when we talk about to federal agencies and you talk about modern software development, advice that you would give to them, no no one's starting at zero, we know mm -hmm. that, but no one's also, you're, you're talking to people who maybe are just getting started. Some people have taken step one, but need to go to step two and three. What types of things would you say, keep this in mind? What are, sure. what are some, some pieces of advice? Sure. I'll say three things. Um, number one, uh, I think at a leadership level, you need to make a strategic decision. Is software a strategic asset to your agency or not? Um, the Fortune 500 have spoken. They clearly realize if they're not just as good at building software as a Silicon Valley startup, they're going out of business. The ability to build great software at startup speed is absolutely a strategic asset to the organization. Leaders and government agencies need to make that decision. Um, if the answer is yes, which I absolutely believe it is, um, then you need to be honest with yourself. There's only one metric that matters, cycle time. Your agency's ability to go from, I've got an idea, to the time that idea is working software in production, touching an end user, being able to being used to enable your mission with your constituent or the warfighter. Um, cycle time is all you uh, is what you have to measure. And if that's not in days or weeks, you're not moving at startup speed. Um, the third thing I would say is start small, 
produce a business or mission outcome that is meaningful and real and create a gravitational pull in your agency to doing more and more things in a modern way. And over time, that the mission will shift from uh, legacy ways and legacy infrastructure to more modern ways of, of leveraging software to enable your mission. All right, very good advice, and especially the first part about make a decision strategic or not. It's hard to argue against that. Uh, unfortunately, that's all the time we have for today. You've been listening to the Innovation and in Government Show, mm-hmm. sponsored by Kerasoft on federalnewsradio.com and 1500 AM. I've been the host, Jason Miller. I'd like to thank my guest, Keith Salisbury, the Senior Director of U.S. Federal Sales for Pivotal. Keith, thank you so much for taking the time today. Thank you. For more on this discussion, visit federalnewsradio.com and search Innovation.